Hey guys, welcome to Pop Culture Curiosities, where I, uh, an indie filmmaker who's worked on some pretty big sets um, as a as a marginally expendable person, uh, tells stories to my friends who have also worked in the film industry about um, the weird stories behind the makings of movies or just strange things that happened in pop culture today. We have Natasha. Hi. How you doing, Natasha? You know. You want to hear a story that's just going to cause you to rethink everything about our job yes. which is it takes a lot at this point honestly we just have existential crises every single day but have you heard of the movie roar have you ever no it's a very obscure movie and there's a whole story behind why why so many people have not seen it but if i can find my notes that i extensively took last night i will tell you so um i told this to gabe before uh this, for our purposes, uh, this surprise is a TARDIS. So you know, every time I always tell uh, Gabe that we're gonna, I'm gonna drag him back to a to a point in time. Mm. Um, so we're gonna go back to like 1976. This okay. Week. Uh, and I have my new light, so oh, I'm gonna break it again. Oh, <laughs> if I can get the. Oh. Spencer, play the play the TARDIS sound. <laughs> we'll pretend that it's not in post. Okay, it's 1976. Sure, that's the way they do it in 1976. Love it. Yes, definitely. Um, okay, so it's 1976, um, and you walk onto this film set, um, and and every you've never worked on a film set before, right? We're newbies. Yeah, got it. Basically, we've walked in off the street. Okay. That's and how we're they all, get extras. And we're all told to stand in a line. Yep. Um, and we don't really know what's happening. We think maybe it's just like a weird industry thing. Yep. Uh, and then we're marched up to where we can see this like fake uh, house set thing that they've built. Okay. And before we can ask any more questions to our uh, new colleagues, we just see like 40 big cats. Lions, tigers, jaguars come running down this basically human tunnel that's been made by okay. these two lines of human shields that have been made out of very new crew members, right? And behind... Sorry, Spencer. And behind the very big cats is a very loud and angry looking man who we don't know this, but he's the director and he's got a two by four in his hand, like a what? piece of plywood. And he's chasing after all these cats. and He's yelling at them. And before you can think to do anything else, he yells to us, don't try to flee or they will kill you. <laughs> This is a real story about how one crew member, very new to the industry, ended up on the set of a movie called Roar, which was made... What's the longest you've ever... Like, what's the longest production as far as, like, how long it stayed in production? Like, the longest that I've ever done or the longest in general? Because just, I don't know. Just for in your experience. In my experience, um, I think it would have been a TV show and it would have been seven months. Yeah. Uh, so they slated nine months for this production. Okay. It went on for five years. Naturally. Yeah. Um, let me back up. Uh, Roar is, it was released in 1981 as a family comedy movie. And so naturally it's about a family being stalked by wild cats in a big enclosure. That's what I think of when I think of comedy. Yeah. That, that's just <laughs> wholesome family. So funny. How has Hallmark not done that? They, like, fall in love in the enclosure. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And it's Christmas. They are set up by the cats themselves for a blind date, and it all happens in the enclosure. Yes. At Christmas. Um, but he doesn't celebrate Christmas because he's an atheist. Yes. 
And he finds the true meaning of Christmas. And they're both incredibly white. This in writes appearance itself. and personality. This writes itself. Hallmark, give us a call. <laughs> <laughs> please. Actually, um, you can have that one for free. We have plenty more. <laughs> yes, please. Please. <laughs> this is a wealth of knowledge we've got going on over here. Honestly, though, I would watch it. 100%. Uh, so the film was made by Noel Marshall and Tippi Hedren. Um, I didn't really know about Noel Marshall, like... In and of himself, I know about Tippi Hedren. Um, you know, yeah. she was you know in all the old timey movies, and she's the grandmother of Dakota Johnson, mm-hmm. um, and the mother of Melanie Griffith, who also was in this movie as a young person. Um, they were married, and they wanted to make a movie together along with their real life children. So they jumped to Wild Cats when planning to have their children on set. Um, this was Noah Marshall's first and somehow only directorial project. Wow, really? I know. Can they didn't tap him for anything no. else? No. Wow. You're going to understand why in a second. Um, they actually first got the inspiration for the concept for the movie when they were in Mozambique um, for Tippi Hedren's movie Satan's Harvest. Now, Satan's Harvest sounds like a very... Um, scary movie apparently it's not it is an action adventure family comedy i've never seen it we they had a def- different definition of family <laughs> then there's there's a very specific definition they had that was not the same as everyone else's satan's harvest such a fun name for oh a movie. so family funnily enough that's not that's not the central part of the story that's just the setup so while they're in mozambique Mozambique. Okay. Mozambique. I, I I gaslight myself into thinking that I'm saying everything wrong all the time. Um, they apparently happened upon a house full of wild cats. Um, as one does. I was very confused as, as to how you just happen upon... Like, I was like, did they break into somebody's home? And we're like, there's a bunch of cats here. Um, apparently it was a house that didn't have any human inhabitants, but had been overrun with lots of lions, and they came up with this concept for a movie about a scientist that lives in harmony with a bunch of big cats. His family comes to visit him, working with the cats. They don't know he's living with all the big cats. Hijinks ensue. This is the movie. Okay. Yeah. Fam- Not following the logic there, but all right. Um, it's okay. Y- you're gonna... There's not a whole lot of logic to go around. To know. I mean, the plot's kind of thin, but you might be wondering, like, I was at this point in digging in, where do the real-life cats, like, why yeah. do the cats, how did this become so dangerous? Because I feel like even in the 70s, there's a way to do this kind of movie without it being so dangerous. Yeah. Um, you would hope. The couple decided to set the movie in Africa, but it was shot in California. Naturally. Uh, and in 1971, so this is several years before they plan to start because they're doing pre-production very thoroughly, um, they, um, they began to raise lion cubs in their home with their children in Sherman Oaks, California. That sounds very legal. <laughs> and very safe. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Um, nothing could go wrong with that plan. Um, they thought raising the lion cubs alongside their actual children mm. Uh, their actual human family. Yeah. Uh, they thought that would make the lions tamer and therefore minimize the risk of injury to cast and crew when they were actually filming the movie. Um, it did not. <laughs> so the lion cubs that they raised along their flesh and blood, <laughs> squishy children, yes. somehow <laughs> continued to be wild as they grew up yes. because they began as wild animals. Yeah, Got because it. they're wild animals that you're not supposed to have that doesn't sound legal but i mean you know i feel like that's the least of their worries at that point they're basically using their children as just like guinea pigs for this like yeah it's like they they, they'll feel a little bit badly if they try and kill us because we've raised them alongside of our children what a sacrifice we made they can't instill morals into the cats like they can't pull the parent thing of like look at all the stuff i've done for you on a cat it's a cat the cat will still eat you. Yeah, um, it will. Happily. Danny Gonzalez, who is a YouTuber who covered this on his channel a while back, um, he said, uh, I don't know the exact quote, but he basically said, these cats could be raised by Mary Poppins and they will still try to eat her in her sleep because they're wild cats. Because wild. Um, it gets worse, though. It's exciting. 
Um, it's funny because they actually went out of their way to ask their children. They sat them all down and they said, "Hey, we're gonna be in it. We're gonna do a movie. Um, we want you guys to be in it, but we want you to want to be in it." And yeah. Three of their four children were like, "Yeah, I'll be in it." The oldest one was like, "Nah." Oldest one it. had 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 had. There were hints. The oldest one <laughs> got picked up on pretty quickly. <laughs> Which is all fine and good. I respect that they respect their children. But then the oldest one still had to live in this house with all of these wild cats. They didn't give them a, a choice on the wild cat. Okay, apparently. so we want your opinion, but it's it's going to be <laughs> noted and then ignored. Got yeah, the it. part of the plan that's not going to put your life in danger, you can opt out of this part. Perfect. Love it. Um, Great parenting. Yeah. Um, um, so their son... John Marshall, mm. who is kind of like he calls himself the spokesperson for this movie. Mm. Um, he took on several roles in the behind the scenes of this movie, and he actually was working on it into his 20s because that's how long it took to get it done. Um, he's gone on to do many interviews. Um in there's a podcast called The Industry with Dan Delgado. I got some of the uh information for this podcast from that one, mm. and I actually was like, you know. Once I had gotten to the point where I had read several articles, I was like, do I need to listen to this podcast? What else could they tell me? There was more. There was even more. And I was like, how is there more to this story? Um, but anyway, on this podcast, John, the son, who's obviously now an adult, he uh, just goes on to describe this precarious process of obtaining the lions where they interviewed lions, which just makes me think about like sitting them down and like checking their references to yeah. see if they're like a a reputable lion um but you can't it have any of those gnarly uh, inreputable lions it wouldn't happen it basically involved trying to get together with trainers mm. who have trained the lions to then agree to kind of let them I don't know, borrow the lions i don't know exactly what the whole process was. procure I, the lions procure the lions i this is i i watched the first season of tiger king but even i i, I don't know uh what this process looks like so i'm still a bit confused i think they were too but see the thing was no trainer who knew anything about lions was gonna put their male lion yeah First of all, in with other lions, yeah. other male lions. Yeah, Secondly, no. around these children. Yeah, no. And then when the family is like, but we need like 10 of the lions. We can't just have like one or two. That yeah. would be ridiculous. Yeah. They basically were just like, yeah, go get your own lion. Imagine that. So they did that. Of course they did. And then, so I'm thinking once the trainers are out of the picture, where do you get the lions That's from? true. Um, so. Cradle rob lions? There's been a heist at the Sherman Oaks Zoo. Like, how do you get these lions? Do you <laughs> do you like put an ad in the paper? Do the lions bring themselves? Like, genuinely, I'm just over here with so many questions as he's telling the story. Um, he goes on to say that they basically would take in lions. Um, Off they the would street homeless <laughs> lions. Well, no, that's the thing. The lions had homes because apparently in the 70s in California, there were a bunch of families that were just like, yeah, lion, that's a great pet to raise with my children. Wow. So they did that. And then surprise, surprise, as soon as, and this is how John puts it. He's very nonchalant when he tells the story. He had story. a lot of therapy. Or he needs a lot of therapy. One, one or the other. The two things. Are, we're all in one bucket or the other, you know? It's true. <laughs> um... He says that, you know, the families had adopted them and then got rid of them after they started ruining their furniture and eating their kids. He says, that, <laughs> I, I assume no children were actually eaten, but he says eating the kids. He probably like, nibbled you know, a little bit. You know, because he grew up with the lions. It's like He's a char like, charcuterie you know. board. You just, you just nibble a little bit, figure out which one you like best. He's over here thinking, I did it. It builds character. You know, they could have, they could have toughed it out for the lion. Yeah. Um, they also would literally take in, um, they would also take in fully grown lions, which feels counterintuitive to the whole plan of trying to raise them with yeah. your children. Like, mm -hmm. I thought that was the whole point of why they were doing it like this. Adopt, don't shop. He literally said they would literally take in anything, which, like, my mom works, we work with our local foster. Yeah. Uh, my grandmother is also very much like my mom, whereas, like, she, my mom grew up in a house full of animals. 
I have grown up in a house full of animals. Yep. Animals just kind of show up, right? Yeah. Somebody's just like, there's nobody to take these two yep. birds. And then my mom's sight on scene is just like, yes, I will take in these two birds. <laughs> what kind of birds are they? I don't know. They turned out to be parakeets, but like, what if they weren't? What if they were like ostriches? <laughs> she didn't know. When Peacocks. She was. <laughs> Peacocks, yeah. <laughs> Free range chicken. She didn't know, but we just have two birds now. You might be able to hear them in the background of this recording. Yeah, probably. And four cats and two dogs because they just kind of show up when yeah. you're working. Yeah. But they did this with like big cats, lions, tigers, jaguars. Uh, what's another big cat? Panthers. Mountain they did this lion. with panthers. Mountain lions. They did this with mountain lions. Um, wild animals that are wild. Animals that shouldn't be in your home. Not domesticated. Um... That same son, John, ended up running the ranch that they had to start to house all of these big cats. Mm -hmm. um, because when you know how you said this doesn't sound legal? Yeah. Even in the 70s, even in California, this was not legal. And the police were just like, you have 24 hours to de-big cat your house. And so Noel Marshall said, fuck it. We're going off on our own property where we can have all the big cats we want. So they start this Naturally. ranch. Mm -hmm. Um in true, like, my childhood happened in the 70s fashion, John not only is, like, basically as a teenager running this place by himself, it okay. sounds yeah. like. Or I'm sure he, it wasn't by himself. But child like, labor laws. He was basically in, responsible for a lot of this. Mm -hmm. uh, in true 70s childhood fashion, though, he taught himself how to operate big machinery like the backhoe and went through two hours of training on how to take in their elephant, which they had an elephant at this point. Naturally. Because why not? You've got Because why not? Um, he went through two hours of training from somebody um, on how to take the elephant in and out of its enclosure, which he says didn't help because it attacked him twice. Um, he also played with his first big cat at 13. So, like, he had a lot of experience, or he felt like he had a lot of experience with these cats, so who else is going to do this job? Um, if you look up this movie... Right. If you look up all of like pictures from this movie, they're insane because every single one of them is a lion either at least gently or it's supposed to be gently on camera, but it's probably less than gently biting a human person or just chasing somebody. Like there's a whole scene in the trailer yeah. that it's just a kid like riding on a trike and these four lions are just barreling after him. And I think that was meant to be like, oh, look at how cute, you know, the, the child and his big cats you know yeah the child with his animals and not the animals chasing their prey i think they were going for like some kind of homeward bound situation but instead of like a, a, a grizzled and wise golden retriever it's huge cats that, that see are this wild child as food yes. like yes that are wild yes um but like every time stuff like this happens in the in the trailer like or in the movie, this like wistful nostalgic music is playing in the background. Like, ah. kind of really hammer it, hammer yeah. it home. This is what we mean it to come across as. Yeah, they wanted like second. No one lions, is, but like, no one is in danger. I'm like, having a seizure. <laughs> you remember in Secondhand Lions where it was really sad because the old guy died and yeah. like willed his lion to Haley Joel Osment. It's they were going for that, but it's as if the lion ate the old guy instead, and then he still willed it to Joel Osman. I think is the it's weird. Like, gotcha. It's weird messaging. Like yeah, it signals definitely going mixed. On. I actually real quick. The trailer is on YouTube. Spencer can put some of this in uh, for the for the folks watching at home. Yeah. This is this is the, the, this is the trailer. I like I like the song. And this, this trailer came out when the movie was finally released in America, which was quite a while. Right. Oh, yeah. No, that, that, that doesn't look comfortable. Oh, it's safe. Yeah. It's just like life. You get the funny with the tragic. Yeah. You are the eagle in the sunrise. Hear the music of the children in the moonrise. Feel the power of the... The cat's got a little excited. Yeah, that's all. Oh, that looks so dangerous. Right. How? So. So for those of you at home. Natasha's giving Why? me the computer. <laughs> yeah. What is, is correct? So basically, <laughs> the trailer just shows, like, all of these people being... It's supposed to be, like, cute the way that they shot it. By the time it was re-released, the people re-releasing it knew that it was not cute. But... 
it was shot meant to be like cute like oh look at him playing with the lines i don't know how some of these actors survived like there is literally just a shot in there of like the dad of the movie just under a pile of lions and it's just like how did he not none of them looked friendly nope no it didn't look like a cute like lion and the lamb situation no and then the when they were saying the actors it said like what had happened to them was that real Oh, about the injuries? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to get into that. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> I like how they give that to you in the trailer, so you are not surprised. The tagline that they went with for this movie, which pissed Tippi Hedren off. Um, she was very upset. The The tagline was, no cats were harmed in the making of this film, but 70 cast and crew members were. Um, and funnily enough, John, the son, says... He doesn't think that number is correct. He thinks it's actually higher. He thinks it's, like, at least 80-something. Is this, like, workman's comp where, like, you don't actually want to admit you were hurt because you don't want it on record because then things will happen legally and you'll just get the short end of the stick? Or is it only the people that had to go to the hospital? They couldn't sweep it under the rug. Yeah. Like, I'm not saying that's what they did. I'm not throwing around accusations. But, like, naturally, there are questions that are brought up. You and I know this all the time. Not every injury that happens on set gets reported. Like, like small percentage of anything cast and crew alike get hurt and they're just like you know they're just like encouraged to not report it Mm -hmm. i've had that happen that's at least twice but yeah yeah that's all we need to say right now um and that's nowadays this is not 70s the 70s yeah they barely knew what safety was it hadn't really probably invented yeah osha probably wasn't even in even my parents tell the most terrifying stories of being kids in the 70s and being like yeah we didn't even have seat belts in the car it's just like okay we just hope for the best (laughs) that sounds like what that was this movie was hoping for the best they sure were (laughs) um like I, I put in my notes that in one of those shots with like the the lion like there's a there's a um, there's a picture on IMDb of like a lion sleeping in bed with a small child and it reminds me of Perry sleep my cat sleeping in bed with me but like Perry when she's an 11 12 pound cat she's right? a cat like a like a domesticated cat yeah so like when she she's super bougie she thinks she's yeah. a human she might be a human we're not even yeah, sure we're, we haven't we haven't Jury's figured that out yeah. Perry, there's yeah. something not right with that cat but when she sleeps like on my neck it's at worst annoying right it's yeah. more just like oh it's too hot yeah. for this it's yeah. july yeah it's a lion <laughs> that is a lot of pounds <laughs> that is larger than most humans grown humans like can you imagine walking in and being like all right stand in go over there swap out with your actor kid like <laughs> i would cry <laughs> can you imagine like casting calling you You know what they, they've called me on the phone and been like so you're okay with a bathing suit right and it's like yeah. well i guess i have to be because yeah. i'm literally in my car on the way now like, yeah. what are you gonna do if i say no yeah um, or like, hey, you're comfortable standing in for a sex scene, which they've done that to me before. And it's like, cool. Well, I'm like 10 minutes away. So I guess I am. Guess that's something you should have told me before I took the job if you really cared about my opinion. But, but I mean, sure, here know, we are now. Here we are. While, while we're here. <laughs> um, wow. Um, Do they even have stand ins? I don't know. Like, I. I have heard John Marshall talk about this movie a lot, but I still have so many questions. Like, he I would. Needs- I need therapy just from I, listening to them. We haven't even gotten to the worst parts yet. Oh, this is exciting. I know. I was like, I was like, it's a little bit weird to be like, hey, Natasha, do you want to sit in the closet while I talk to you about this thing? But also, I knew Natasha would like the story. Yeah. We're cat people. Even we can't imagine certain kinds of, certain kinds of cats just shouldn't be with people. Agreed. Um... Uh, Tippy Hedren said at one point when they consulted animal trainers on how to go about making this movie, uh, they laughed at them, which... Yeah. Either laugh at them or or cry and call someone. I don't even know who you call for this, <laughs> but you, you need someone. Well, if they weren't able to get trainers to agree to give them their lions and they had to like go about possibly illegally getting these lions, which probably is what happened, I mean just that's that's there's so much liability there's a lot to this day there's a lot of sketchy laws around procuring these animals that's That's why tiger king exists right we're all horrified that's true in quarantine and there was really nothing else on the watch because nobody else was making stuff um but anyway but anyways we we digress 50 years ago this was definitely not better Um, no 
In more recent years, John has gone on to say in interviews, uh, quote, we had floods, we had fires, every one of us wound up in the hospital, and there were times when we got together as a family and we would go, I think we should give it up, but we never gave up. It has to do with dealing with lions and, and tigers. You can't show fear. If you show fear, you're dead. You have to be stronger than them. You have to be stronger than anything in life. <laughs> These are wild animals. <laughs> this isn't like a criminal that you're like trying to outsmart. No. This is a lion who does not care about you, does not care if you're afraid. No. Afraid or not, you're still going to taste the same to the lion. It's true. Right? And the lion, I like the lions probably aren't like hunting like they, I hope they're not hunting like they would. Yeah, how do they feed them? Well, they, I'm sure they fed them, like, raw meat, but, like, don't cats have, like, instincts to hunt? Yes. Like, my cats, the who are indoor domesticated cats... Domesticated cats do. My cats, who are indoor cats... Yeah. Um, ...will still bring me their little, like, jingle toys yeah. as if it's a dead mouse, yeah. because it's just in their nature to yeah. do so. These lions were probably ready to kill something. Oh, I'm sure. Um, And they weren't allowed to, because they were trying to domesticate them. But I just... <laughs> Like, we never gave up. You have to be stronger than the lions and stronger than anything else in life. He was a literal child when they were making this movie. He was a young adult by the time they were finished with it. But, like, he w he started this process when he was 13, right? How many scars did he have? Emotionally or physically? Because I, I have so many questions. <laughs> Probably more emotional than physical. So I was interested about how floods and fl fires played into all yeah. this. It's now stopped starting to sound less like a Hollywood horror story and more like a biblical cautionary tale, right? Yeah. Like, God sent floods. I think the world was trying... God was trying to say <laughs> something. And locusts to tell them to stop doing what they were doing, but they kept on, right? Apparently, they went through... Because they're filming out in the desert. Yeah. Low, in a low valley. They're having flash floods, just as, as you do. Yeah. But a, on top of the flash floods, there was a dam that had been, like... There was this whole backstory about, like, the dam was, like, hastily built by politicians, and it wasn't a good idea. The dam breaks because oh, of... Naturally. Right. Because, because, yes. They are basically below where the dam is. That's oh, where yeah. they're filming. Of course. So they got hit with what was described later as, like, a wall of eight feet of water just rushing in on them. Very exciting. Yeah. So just to make things worse, just to... Just, yeah. Just, just a little, little cherry up. on top. Um... So they basically tra were trapped on what wasn't an island before, but what was an island currently. Got it. Uh, and had to be kind of ferried across. Like, the actors had to be ferried across what was now just a straight-up river. Yeah. That was just, like, rapidly flowing, right? And they tell stories about seeing, like, you know... Household equipment yeah, and just trees. debris. And debris just, like, going past them. Because it's a flash flood. And and a dam breaking, which is basically also a flash flood. As some poor crew member is just like, well, got to get first team to set. Like, this is insanity. Like, Tiffany Hedren already, from what I heard, had a bunch of trauma from working 20 years prior with Alfred Hitchcock. Yeah. This poor woman shouldn't be putting herself or her children. Like, she doesn't need to be going through this. No. You know, she's doing all this in this for the sake of like teaching people that like these big cats can coexist with humans, and she's learning in real life why that's not a good idea. <laughs> not true. Um, just because you think it real hard doesn't mean it's true. She, it's just, it's honestly just like she really gave it the old college try, but the college was full of lions, and it didn't really go so well. Like there, it can't be overstated. Lions, tigers, children. What could go wrong? I lost my notes because there's just so much travesty on the... This is just a huge clusterfuck if I've ever read about one. Um, it just keeps... It just keeps expanding. It's pretty impressive. Oh, yeah. You get deeper and deeper and deeper. The advo advocacy for big cats is really going well, right? They're having forest fires. Yeah. I still didn't get any straight answer on the fires. I assume it's just California and yeah. at a certain point. California just lights on fire for a couple months every year and we just act like that's normal We're yeah it's like yeah you know whatever um they've got bigger things to deal with if you can believe it um so at this point of the story i'm thinking hollywood was even weirder in the 70s than i expected right? it must it must be like i picture hollywood in the 70s as like everybody's on psychedelics yeah um and everybody has bell-bottom jeans yeah. and laws just don't exist 
right? Apparently, I was not that far off no? in that assumption. I don't believe so. Um, but even back then, this was not something you could just do. Because they have cats, big cats in a residential neighborhood, basically. They're living with them, and then they're also bringing them to set. Thinking about the HOAs back then. <laughs> they're just walking their lion, right? Like, you know, my neighborhood has those little people put up those passive aggressive, don't poop on my lawn yeah. sign, clean up after your dog. Like, did they have special ones made for, like, big cats? Like, so many questions. Um, and, you know... They, you know, so they end up on their own property. Uh, the son has since said in interviews that he was, quote, the voice of reason because he would constantly tell his parents that tigers aren't in Africa. Why do we have mountain lions? That's not from the proper region. And he would just kind of get waved off by the adults in his life who were like, ah, you know, so he was best. gaslit. <laughs> but it's funny because not only did they wave him off, but he's the voice of reason as a teenager. Also, he's not thinking about, like, safety. He's just thinking about, like, the logistics. He thinks that, like, continuity of, all of, of the 1970s is going to come to bite him in the ass. He's not, like, thinking, like, oh, this is really dangerous, right? Because how he's been living with these big animals since, like, the kids were kind of little. So, like, they don't know. Well, they're here. Um... He also had to share a bedroom with said mountain lion that he thought shouldn't be in the movie. So like but the mountain lion had some had some bones to pick with him, literally. He wanted to pick his bones. He wanted, he wanted to pick his bones. He didn't care how it happened. Like literally. John w apparently John adapted very well to the situation though. Sounds like he did. And he would apparently use his pet tiger um that he had through this whole situation to pick up girls. Like, he tells this story, quote, I had this tiger that I absolutely loved called Nikki. I would take him down to a local luncheon bar place and girls would go, oh, my God, can I play with your tiger? I'd go, I'd say, I'd say, well, not right now, but if you give me your phone number. So he used this tiger as a wingman. Literally, I put that in my notes. Apparently, like the tiger was the guy's wingman. That's what I wrote. Like I'm also still stuck on he took a lion to a bar. <laughs> Can you imagine you're at a bar? This is my emotional support tiger. Some guy comes up to bother you, which is already annoying when you're out, like with yeah. your friends. But then he's like, "Hey, ladies, you want to play with my tiger?" All innuendos aside, that's weird as hell. Yeah. And apparently this would work because girls were girls in the 70s. They were just must like, have been on so many drugs. They, they were just were like, really hey, like man. Because, <laughs> like, I would be like, oh, my God. That is a wild animal. Police. <laughs> Call somebody, right? Are you going to murder me behind this bar with your tiger? Um... So principal photography on Roar started October 1st, 1976 in Santa Clarita, where most of the movie was filmed. At that point, the animal cast numbered 132 lions, tigers, leopards, cougars, and jaguars with a 10,000-pound bull elephant that we mentioned before. His name was Timbo. Actually. <laughs> because what else? You know, I'm thinking, like, when they were trying to get some of these these big cats, they there was an elephant, and they're like, we'll throw the elephant in for free, and they're like, why not? <laughs> Like a buy two yes! jaguars to get an elephant. Couldn't get rid me. of the elephant, so they're like, hey, you want this elephant? It's like the Island of Misfit Toys. <laughs> but it's not toys. No, it's wild animals that will eat you. Production ended up going on for over five years, and when all was said and done, the budget for the film had gone to over $17 million, which I already checked in today's money would look more like $88 million. God. This was like an Avengers level endeavor this was like cats the movie but with actual cats instead of like james corden in like a cat suit right like this was this was a lot not sure what's more traumatizing <laughs> jury's still out <laughs> part of the reason it took so long to film in the first place was that they had to keep taking breaks so that they could get more money shockingly no one wanted to fund the outback steakhouse for lions the movie right like no one was like jumping at the bit for this opportunity plus taking care of all of those animals right. even minimally would be quite expensive uh the other reason production kept being halted temporarily was because multiple times cast and crew members had to recover from the injuries they obtained on set um that sounds super safe 
Tippi Hedren later wrote in her book about her experience making the movie. The book is titled Cats of Shambhala. Shambhala is the the place where they raise them. Um, In 1985, she wrote this book or she came out with this book and she said it did. uh, She said that she did it initially because she wanted to basically advocate for humans and big cats being able to live side by side. Uh, This is not the outcome that she did not get the outcome she wanted. No. 72 hospital visits on record. 72. At that point, the hospitals should be calling CPS and being like, hey, there's these children that keep coming in with these bites from wild children, animals. Children, grown men, Tippi Hedren herself, like one of the most famous women in Hollywood. Like, what's going on down there? Like, the doctors have to be asking so many questions. That was where the money was going. They had to, like, pay them <laughs> under, the, under the table, be like, hey, don't say anything. That was a $17 million budget. <laughs> the, the, the hospitals were taking home, like, $15 million of that. Exactly. Uh, healthcare is expensive in, in, in America. It is. We got to pay our own way with that stuff out here. For those of you everywhere else that doesn't make, them do, make people do that. So when you said, are those numbers accurate? They're going off of just the hospital visits. Not the injuries, not the reported injuries, just the ones that were bad enough for hospital stays. 72 hospital trips. Uh, John Marshall, the son, only says he received less than 60 stitches, uh, according to reports that a big cat, quote, used his head like a chew toy. And it apparently took 25 minutes and several guys to get the cat off of the young person. I don't know how old he was, if he was over 18 or not, but it doesn't really matter. No. Um, and then he had to continue working with that cat for five years in which he notes, like, this is his words, like, not verbatim, but he basically says, I had to work with this cat for five years after he tried to kill me. And he says, in those five years, the cat was trying to finish the job. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's so, so nihilistic. It's just like, yep. Had to work with my coworker. He didn't succeed in killing me, but had to keep. He kept trying. His stepsister, a young Melanie Griffith, was actually slashed across the face and needed cosmetic surgery because of all of this. Okay. Um, their mother, Tippy Hedren, broke her leg and suffered gangrene when Timbo the the oh the sorry elephant. not the lion the elephant yes. yeah when Timbo you know you know Timbo we like Timbo. The the elephant crushed her leg between his trunk and his tusk. I'm so sorry. I, it's, it's, Elephants can be very violent. No, for real. It's like hippopotamus. Yeah. Hippopotami? Hippopotamuses. Hippopotamuses. You look at them and you're like, those are so cute. Those things are the serial killers of the animal kingdom. Those things will kill you and not think twice about it. Nope. Noelle Marshall, her husband, uh, suffered everything from cuts and bruises to blood poisoning somehow. I'm not sure how. I guess there's a lot of ways you could he, get blood he, poisoning. He didn't want to go to the hospital. So he's like, yeah, it's fine. And also gangrene. I guess everybody just got gangrene back in the day. It was going around. You know. Um, Bill's character. He was also directing and producing this movie. Mm. And his son uh, would have to call him because his son is basically working as an AD, a PA. He's barely 18, less yeah. than 18 at some points of this. But his son, John, it says he would have to call him up and be like, Dad, we've been ready to get picture up for like half an hour. Where are you? Um, And his dad would be like, OK, I'm out. I'm out. Because he was always on the phone trying to get more money for this project. Right. So they're out there waiting for him so they can get filming. He's in the back, like trying to haggle money out of more people. And he'd be like, OK, I'm on my way. And apparently John would yell at him and say, Dad, I can hear that you're in the bathtub. I don't know why he had to do the negotiating in the bathtub, but John knew. It's a safe space. Yeah. <laughs> where you can cry. <laughs> yes. Let the water run and kind of yeah. drown out the sobs yeah. and the screams. Yeah, exactly. He's trying to drown out like the horrific screams of like, it's so dark. Just like chaos outside, yeah. right? So his son is yelling at him, telling him to get his ass out there because yeah. they're all standing around with lions staring them down. Yeah. And they need to get this shot. Yep. Um, Days would actually go by without getting a shot at all. And they would never move on from any shot until they'd been on it for a few days. Two to four, John says. What? This was because the lions were not trained. And getting a lion to do what you want it to do or even remotely like what you want it to do 
They would barely know what they were filming that day. Children and animals. They never was, work with it them. It was all basically like improv, but very dangerous improv. Um, Life or death improv. Yeah. Life or death death improv. That would be, that's somebody's like improv troop, right? Yeah. That's somebody's like school yep. that they're going to. Yep. Um, John says that at the end of the day, instead of like comparing notes and being like, oh, that was a good take. I really like this take. Like normal actors get yeah. to do. Uh, they would look at each other at the end of the day and go, and go, well, we're not in the hospital, so it must have been a good day. <laughs> Reminds- I can't believe this shit. This like, is- I've already read this twice and had to do all the research for this. I can't believe what I'm reading to you right now. Oh, <laughs> well, we're not dead yet. John has such a this might as well happen energy. I don't know whether to respect or fear this man or both. Each- yeah, yeah. So any day above ground is a good day, I guess, in the in the words of my grandmother. Um, I think it's a generational thing you know he's he has very millennial energy and he's not even a millennial he is gen x <laughs> so their dp um he later he was the guy who later went on to direct speed and twister i apparently in all this note taking forgot to take down his full name but yeah. that guy yeah he, he he went on to be a big successful director Apparently, he got so many injuries, they were afraid he wasn't going to be able to finish the film. Uh, This poor man needed, I wrote down 120 stitches. It's actually 220 stitches. I double and triple checked myself. He needed 220 stitches once after he basically got scalped by a lioness. John says about the incident, quote, I got him on the way to the hospital and I went into the office and I said, okay, we need to get a new TP because that one is not coming back. That's so dark. <laughs> so sorry for laughing. It's not so funny. dark. It's not. It's funny because he lived through it. It's not funny. But can you <laughs> like? Well, I guess we ruined that one. Just like this, like oh well, whoopsie daisy attitude that apparently they just all had in the seventies, or maybe it was just this family. Like this, this family sounds like a parallel version of the Adams family. Where it it's does, just like though. oh well. Look at that. The lion got out. The Adams family had a pet lion that we saw sometimes, and I used to be horrified looking at it being like, they really did just bring a lion on set, didn't they? Back in the day. This is like 132 big cats. So after the DP... (laughs) Almost died. Almost dies. He's like, we need a new DP because that one's not coming back. But apparently, he says he did come back and finish the whole movie. He says, I was amazed. What a trooper. <laughs> what a trooper. <laughs> His words. Um, he like a like a like a patch, like a Girl Scout patch. What a trooper. <laughs> you did it. Only bled a marginal amount. Good for you. You almost lost your scalp, but not completely. <laughs> there was enough of it left so that they could put it back on there for you this is so dark i hope everybody is okay (laughs) at this point in time jesus christ this is so horrible it's like i'm having like that nervous laughter response because my brain doesn't know how how else to process it (laughs) i would also hasten to point out that the family behind this movie was sponsoring this poor man's green card and also getting him into the union so i'm wary to to say that the guy just came back because he was such a trooper Uh, yeah that that that's just he just True loved work in his job so or... much. This feels a little bit like coercion. I wasn't there. I just have quite. It's like, are you okay? We're just, we're just putting it, putting it like it seems. It shouldn't surprise you that multiple crew members did in fact leave because of how fucking dangerous this was. I would have walked like the first time I saw all those cats. It also shouldn't surprise you this was a non-union production. Oh. We've already gotten there in our brains, right? I... No union would be okay with this, right? No. <laughs> what could they possibly have an issue to raise with this movie? So much above board. All no, of it. Yeah. So bo- above board. It's it's the most abovest of boards. One day, 18 crew members walked at once. I'm impressed that that's such a low number. I'm impressed that they found 18 people to work on this movie, Right. Retired sound mixer Tim Cooney wrote about working on Roar that he had first been hired as an animal trainer and noted that these filmmakers had a lot of nerve doing this, with many being hired off the street to, quote, throw meat and be human shields. 
I know we joke about how expendable all of us are in the film <laughs> industry. <laughs> so terrible. But like, I remember we were standing on set together at once. And we had a PA that was had a very, let's say, dry sense of humor. You're yeah. going to know what set this was in a second. There was that big wall um, that was just standing there. And oh, you and I yeah. said, what if the wall topples onto an extra? And yep. without missing a beat, our PA goes, well, we'll have to get a new wall. And we're like, aren't you going to miss us? He's like, I mean, I can get a new extra for a lot less than it would cost me to get a new wall. And I was just like, thanks a lot, man. But you know what there wasn't? Lions there to scalp us. <laughs> there were on that set pyrotechnics to catch people's hair on fire. Well, yeah. Almost. I mean, the sparks were going in yeah. their hair. It wasn't like a full blown, yeah. you know, but like there was that. But there were no lions. There were no lions. I did get my fair share of cuts and bruises, but not from lions. Nope. Uh, so this guy ended up having a really successful career as a sound mixer. But this was his first set and he was hired as an animal trainer. No experience. I was going to say, did he even know how to train animals? When they say animal trainer, they just mean somebody to corral the animals and maybe be the first appetizer before, just kind of slow him down before he gets to the first team. <laughs> the, the, the slower friend when you're running from a bear. <laughs> it's so morbid. I just... Um, this was Tim's first set. And at the end of it, he had transitioned to a career in sound. Um, he says his first day... He was told to, this brings us back to where we started, stand in this line. There's two lines of people. They're just not, they're not told what to do. It's like when you get there and you're an extra and they're just like, go over there. And you're like, why am I over here? Why am I in this room? I'm all alone over here. This feels like the wrong place for me to be. Yep. But you're just like, they're just like, no, be over there. Put them in two lines, march them down to this place where all of these cats run. Sorry, Spencer. All of these cats run out of this enclosure chased by the director who's shouting like a crazy with person. With a two-by-four. With a plot. I, we actually don't know the measurements of the board. I'm picturing a two-by-four. It was just a big plywood board, I guess. I'm sure you're all enthralled by how big the board may or may not have been. Um, I just want to be accurate uh, and not be called a bad researcher. <laughs> um, no, I'm kidding. I am a bad researcher. So before this guy, no, this is his first day on set, and he's like, they tell me to stand in this line. I think it's just some weird, like, set thing yeah. that everybody knows to do. Oh, you know, how you all line up at the beginning and end of every day. Like no. you're about to be shot. <laughs> now there's all these big cats running by him, in between him and the other line of people. And then the the, the director who's don't chasing, move. it's like, don't move or they will kill you. Like, can you... The fact that the man came back at all... I know, the fact that the man stayed in the film industry... And that's not a, like, oh, it's on him because he stayed. Like, they're lucky that anybody stuck around to finish this thing. Oh, yeah. Um, He goes on to say, I've worked in, or, I'm sorry, a different camera operator goes on to say, I've worked in film 50 years and I've never had anything quite like that. Um, I'm sure, I'm glad to hear he hasn't, that there was not a repeat performance. Um... Because this man tells a story at one point about having to dive to safety because one of the lions was about to tear into him. He ditched his camera and was not injured. However, the camera was torn up by the lion, who was over 100 pounds. Naturally. Uh, the scariest part, he says, is when the lion dropped the camera and made its way over to him anyway. Apparently, Panavision kept the mangled camera as a trophy. And it's just still sitting somewhere in someone's office. Wow. <laughs> I feel like he should get to keep the trophy camera. Yeah. Right? It should be in his house. They probably even fussed at him for, for making sure that the camera got hurt, not him. Yeah. In my brain, right? This is, I'm sure, not the truth, but in my brain, there's, like, still, like, lion teeth embedded in I the like camera. I like this idea, though. Yeah. Um, and, like, slashes. Oh, yeah. Um, at one point, he tried to stop a lion by using his head to block it because they hand him a helmet. They walk in, they give him a helmet, and they're like, put this on. And he's like, why? And they open the door and the lion comes running in. Uh, he he ditched the plan for using his head as a as a stopping. Well, that's good. You know, because he realized that the... It wasn't the, gonna stop it. His words, if the lion... I'm so sorry. If the lion wanted to decapitate him, he had the ability to do so basically it's true. like that's basically what he said he's correct i'm glad he thought about that before enacting his plan yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i just love the idea of just like here you go put this on why lion uh, 
I, I see why. I wonder. <laughs> it probably wasn't even a good helmet either. No. It was probably like a bike helmet. Probably right? that had been that had already been used for a crash once, so it didn't even have the safety. Yeah, they like it. took it off the test dummy that yeah. somehow had gotten lice. Yeah, you know, it's exactly. just like yeah, yeah. Oh, to be fair to him, right, the main trainer on hand was not actually a trainer, but just, like, a random guy who showed up and wanted to work. So they were like, yeah, you do this and you do this. You can do that, right? And he was like, yes, I can, sir. Right? So no one knew what they were doing with these animals. There Very was nobody professional. Very Shockingly, exciting. I know that this just screams professionalism. Oh, Every part yeah. of the story so far. Everything um, is so above board. So above board. Yeah, they want that he wanted to work, and they were just like, eh, cool, sure. <laughs> Let's see how long this one lasts. Say less. Say less. Also, they're probably not getting paid oh, a I lot. I don't know. Again, not saying that was true, but um, want some considering exposure? they were running out of money. <laughs> yeah. Do you want the opportunity of a lifetime to really, really <laughs> launch that career of yours? Come work on my death movie. <laughs> They also apparently had these cages that were said to not really hold the lions. They just kind of were there to make the crew feel better. Suggestions. <laughs> yeah, the, it was a, a suggestions, the lions. Like the like the ropes at Disney World. Yeah. You could cut in line. They just want you to know that they will be upset if you yeah. were to do that. It's not, yeah. nothing stopping you. Yeah. Right? Um, Except for when lions, lions don't care. Lions have no morality. Lions, yeah, lions are not quite as... Um, as a feeling as the underpaid workers at Disney World. Yeah. Um, these were more like underfed lions. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I keep losing my place because I've just made so... <laughs> there's so much. And every time you're like, well, that's the worst thing that could have happened. It's not. You remember how you said... Um, the camera guy, the one that almost got decapitated. Yeah, you yeah. remember how you said they probably fussed at him for yeah. like letting mm-hmm. the camera. Yeah, so he ended up quitting, um, because the he didn't quit after all those incidences. He yeah. quit one time when he was uh, the director was shitty enough to critique his camera move while staring down a lion. He's literally face to face with a lion, and and this dude has the has the the balls to be like, you know what? You, that move was really bad. Actually, you didn't get that focus pull right. Like, whatever he said. And this guy was just like, fuck it. That, like, was, that was the straw that, that broke was, the camel's back. That was the very last straw. And weirdly enough, I don't think they had a camel. You know? It, it, that's because they're not bloodthirsty enough. They're, they're, they're not dangerous enough. They're, they're mean. Spit. But, yeah. Um, I'm not... I, I, I wrote in my notes that I'm not specifically putting this specific information about the cameraman in to make our producer, who's also a cameraman, who's also my brother, Spencer, um, realize that there could be worse <laughs> shoots than the shoots that we've put him through. <laughs> it just kind of happened. So there you go. <laughs> Hi, Spencer. Uh, remember that time that you saved Spencer from kneeling in Poison Ivy? Yeah. Yeah. Spencer was just about to put his whole self in Poison Ivy he to was. get the shot. And you were like, hey, that's Poison Ivy. And he was like, Natasha. And then he had Natasha, like, inspect every place where he was going to set up shop because he was scared. Yeah. Um. So the tagline, like we said, was no animals were harmed in the making of this movie. 70 cast members were, quote, as the produ- production of Roar involved lions, tigers, and other dangerous animals, it is unsurprising to learn that people were injured during the production, but 70 sounds like an exaggeration. This is a direct quote from mm. one of the articles I was reading. Um, but John, like I said, uh, he confirms that he thinks that's inaccurate. He says it was probably higher than that. It, by his estimate. Yeah. He's probably right. He went on to say in hindsight, he knows how stupid doing the film was. Um, I, I would like to interject that he was a child, he was a at child. Least when it started, so I don't really blame him no. for any of this. Um, he says he was amazed nobody died. And again, Danny Gonzalez, who covered this on his channel like a year or two ago, he's like, everybody who talks about this movie talks about it like, whoo, that was a close one. But it's like, nah, man, like 72 people in the hospital. That was one. I mean, like, the you DP can't... almost died. Yeah, that's not like, ooh, we really got away with something. That's like, it's you're lucky that you're not being sued or worse yeah. over this right now, right? Hedren and Marshall divorced soon after the movie was finished being filmed in 1982. So like a year Shocking. after the movie is finished. And I was going to make a joke that I then took out about it being because of the cats that they got a divorce. <laughs> but they cited the stress of making this movie as like, what like befell their marriage 
I mean, that's I can see that. I can absolutely see that. It's like, you know how they say, like, if you really think you love somebody, go and build something from Ikea with them yeah. and see if you can still handle them. This feels like that on crack, right? Yeah. During the production, Tippi Hedren told the press that she thought the movie would make $125 million. How much money do you think this movie made? Like, genuinely. Like 80000 So they, it made $2 million, okay. roughly. Okay, okay. They spent $17 million on it, so okay. it's not like anybody made any money. In fact, it wasn't distributed in America until just a few years ago in 2015, and uh, John believes that this was because his now late father, who didn't even get to see this be released in, in the U.S., because he had sadly already passed away, but like he thinks it was because um, he had basically lo- borrowed so much money from people with the promise of like giving them a cut of the profits, Yeah, and he knew that they could like trace the u.s profits way more than they could trace like oh all the money that it's making in australia apparently it did great in australia i think it's because australians are just built different and they're just like oh weird you know children being attacked by animals that are deadly that's every day here in the outback um not nothing to it you know yeah um it did really well in a couple places overseas but never got to be uh released in America until 2015 when this like random kind of offbeat art housey place kind of got the rights to it because at this point it's like a legend of Hollywood. Nobody yeah. had seen this movie. Everybody had heard stories about it. Yeah. And people didn't really believe. I want to watch this movie now. Not because I think it's a good movie, just because I <laughs> you need to witness it. I just need closure is what I need. You know, I just need to see it through. Um Tippy, Tippy Hedren was super pissed over the over the no cats were harmed but 70 people were. Mm. Um which like I get it cuz like it's not a joke but also I mean it's true. It is true. It's true, right? So it's just like, yeah, I I see it. I see both sides of that argument. Um because she wrote a book and in her own book that's where the 72 number comes from gotcha. right so they didn't just like pull that number out of nowhere yeah um but she was so pissed that she and her daughter melanie griffith refused to do any press for it uh along with jan the dp who almost died um he was already a big director this point. he was like i don't need i don't care yeah i don't like i don't need to remember that trauma i don't need to go through that again also he says that to this day he hasn't been paid a penny for his work which Honestly, I believe him. I believe him, too, I don't actually. have any reason not to believe him after everything that we've heard. Yeah. Right? Um, the shooting location of the film was... This is kind of the happy ending part of the story. Um, it was eventually made into a protected nature preserve where the big cats could live in peace away from human beings and cameras. Uh, and Tippy herself went on to spend many years caring for the lions and tigers and running this place and being an advocate for why you should not do what they did, right? Yeah. So that's kind of the consolation. Like, this was a very violent way to learn the lesson, but she did learn the lesson. She even went on to advocate and get a bill passed through Congress that basically prohibits, um, I'm not sure if it's just in the state of California, but it prohibits, like, um, the... Um, private ownership of big cats and uses of big cats in like roadside attractions. So that's like fair. That's something. Yeah. Um, and all these years later, and this is what I thought you would get a laugh at. John Marshall is obsessed with danger and says he loves set life because of how dangerous it is. <laughs> Can confirm. Sets are extremely dangerous. I tell yeah. people this all the time. People have this idea about like movies being like old Hollywood glitzy. And, like, there's some definite fun parts and perks, obviously, to doing what you do. It is dangerous. Very much so. A film set is just a glorified construction set. Like, literally. There's, like, stuff being built and torn down. And if you don't know where to... I don't even wear closed toed open-toed shoes anymore in in my personal life. Yeah. Because I saw a girl... Hi, Perry. Oh, look, it's our, it's our domesticated lion. <laughs> um, I saw a girl be yelled at on, like, one of my first days about how, like, she was wearing sandals. And this crew member was like, you realize this cart that I'm pushing could just take your foot straight off. And it, like, scared the hell out of me. And I was just like, well, that's it for that. I used to live in flip-flops. Not anymore. Well, it's like, I know they do it sort of as a joke, but a lot of people, if they're carrying something, they'll say, free dental work. And it's like, it's true. Because if it hits yep. you in the face... You're going to need dental work. Yeah. If you haven't been on set, they're supposed to yell points. 
As because com- something as pointy is coming at you. Sometimes they don't do that, though. No. I was on a set uh, years ago, and they didn't yell points, and they came around. It, thankfully, it was just like a bounce, so it wasn't anything like terminal to be hit with. Uh, but it did smack me right in the face, and the guy felt bad, and it was okay. Well, like, I wasn't really that hurt. But also, if he had just said points, I would have known not to round the corner that he yeah. happened to also be rounding. It's just yeah. like, you know... Oh, so, yeah. so like, you know, you and I have been on very dangerous sets. We've been on sets where people got injured very, very badly. Yep. Uh, this one is... I can't even imagine, right? I can't... Like, we have friends that worked on a movie once where they were trying to get... Allegedly, this is a story that I was told because I wasn't there that day, but allegedly they were trying to get under 18-year-old actors to run alongside basically a flamethrower that they were... Like, dangerous stuff happens on sets all of the time. Yeah. And then the people who are like, actually, that's pretty dangerous. Everybody else in the crew is like, wow, that guy's an asshole. Can you believe he didn't want us to use the flamethrower around children? Yeah. Right? Like, so... Dangerous stuff happens, and so it's just like, this is a cautionary tale. If you're getting into the film industry or in the film industry, just watch yourself out there. Yeah. Um, luckily, I don't think you'll see any, hopefully, live lions anytime soon. They're trying to replace people out with AI. I don't see why they would need the lions anymore. No, but, you know. no, no. But my goodness. Isn't that insane? That is... I like the fact that he's like, yeah, I just feel so at home because, like, the film industry is so scary. It isn't as scary as that. Like, yeah, things do happen. That's a very extreme But that version. is extreme, you know. It's, it's, we have OSHA for a reason. It's just a lot of people will gaslight you and be like, yeah, you're fine. You're, it's, everything's fine. And it's like, if you feel unsafe, let someone know or leave. Like, they'll, they can say all sorts of things to you and that you'll never work again. But, like, that's not true. <laughs> Yeah. You've got the high ground, literally. They, I have the high ground. Yes. And you don't want to be chopped in half like Anakin. So yeah, like exactly. You, know, you you want to they will there will be people that are going to try will, to make you feel they will try and exploit you like not you're a knowing. prima donna for yeah. being like, Owie, yeah. I think I might have broken something. Yeah. That's extreme, but yeah. like that does happen. Well no, like, like I I mean, and I can I can sort of say this without really revealing a lot, but I had a chair fall on me once when I was uh working as a photo double. And in the scene it came from a, a ta- it had been put on top of a bookshelf. Um and when I was supposed to move the bookshelf aside, it fell because it wasn't attached. And I had all of them, even though it happened on film in front of everyone, I had all of them say, Well, if you file an incident report, you just won't work in Atlanta again. And like, and I, and of course, at that point, I was so new, I was scared of that. But I also felt like my ribs were bruised, which they were. Um, and I needed to have an incident report. And I did. And I didn't make a big deal about it because they were like, oh, well, you know, it's kind of like workman's comp. You know, they're like, oh, well, if you're going to do anything else, you have to go see our doctors. And I was like, no, I don't want any of that. But I do want it noted that this happened. <laughs> like, do not gaslight me into saying otherwise. So, yeah. So basically, Perry. <laughs> ASMR brought to you by Perry, who's sitting on my sun chips. Perry. She said the lap wasn't good enough. Go see Auntie Natasha. So, yeah, so that's basically all I've got to say on this one. Wow. Uh, this, I can only imagine, was a nightmare to work on. No kidding. Five years nightmare. Thank you for going on this traumatizing journey with us. Uh, be sure to uh, find us, uh, you know, if you're, uh, you can find us where you find your podcasts. Uh, we are on YouTube, too. Consider going over there and subscribing. You can see the video version and all of our horrified expressions <laughs> to each other. Yeah. Um, I've been doing this thing with Gabe where I'm like, we should see what happened that year before we go back in our TARDIS. Yeah. Uh, uh, apparently, Rocky came out this year. So, like, let's go to the world premiere of rocky they're definitely never gonna make another movie like this and so definitely not like six more of them <laughs> never no let's see can i is it gonna break oh or it's it's working say goodbye perry <laughs> she said goodbye bye guys bye like and rate and comment and do all the things i'm not good enough at podcasts at this point i still don't know what what to tell them to do be happy be happy or try don't work with wild animals yeah know that wild means wild yeah stick to regular house cats like perry she gives kisses 
She's a little bit annoying, but she's she's not gonna kill you. No. At least not on purpose. <laughs> not on purpose. But she did scratch my face once. That wasn't nice. She parkoured off my head. But anyways, yes, I hope you enjoyed it. Bye. <laughs> Bye guys. Thank you.